The history of vampires is deeply Habsburg. The myth of the undead invaded Maria Theresa's empire from the Balkans. The surest means to get rid of them are always the pre-Christian ones. A stake through the chest, head off, and burn everything. That's still the best way to get rid of a vampire. Maria Theresa sends her personal physician, Gerard von Swieten, to get to the bottom of the vampire superstition. He thus becomes the model for Bram Stoker's world-famous novel, Dracula. Gerhard van Swieten was the model for Bram Stoker's Abraham van Helsing, presumably because he was so successful with his hunt for the undead, he got rid of that superstition. It's a battle of enlightenment versus ignorance. It will take about a hundred years to win, but in people's minds the vampire lives on to this day, like an undead of our fantasies and fears. Schönbrunn, in 1755, Empress Maria Theresa has summoned her confidant, Van Swieten. Her Majesty is highly worried. She commissions her personal physician to investigate a terrible incident. The battle against superstition and the hunt for vampires has begun. It's a dirty world we're talking about by modern standards, a dark world. So there's no electricity, there's far less medical care, there's still inadequate food supply, so there are deficiencies, diseases, child deaths. All these things are probably still very normal in the mid-18th century. The other thing, of course, is the political situation. The Ottoman Empire was pushed back out of Europe. The so-called Turks, the Habsburg monarchy of Austria, expanded strongly to the southeast. With the Peace of Karlovitz in 1699, the great Hungarian kingdom came under Habsburg rule. It meant an enormous consolidation for Austria as a great power. Power. Before that, I'd say it was more of a medium power than a great power. And it also means a more sustainable safeguard for Vienna as a location. In other words, it eliminates the constant uncertainty that the proximity of the Ottoman Empire has meant. It was an incident in an upper Silesian village in Hermersdorf, near the Moravian border, on the river Morava. One could say that they dug up half the cemetery there. About 30 corpses were dug up because the local population suspected that they were vampires. 19 of them were found to be vampires, two of them were women. Children were also affected because they showed little signs of decomposition which was the most important characteristic. Maria Theresa was outraged by this incident. Outraged, above all, that the local administration didn't intervene and immediately handed the case over to her personal physician and confidant, Gerard van Swieten. Van Swieten übergeben. The sinister incident deeply affects Maria Theresa, partly because of her unshakable Catholic faith and partly because she is committed to the ideals of enlightenment and rationality. It is the point in history where medicine in Austria begins to be placed on a purely scientific basis 
Everything irrational and unprovable is visibly banished, but only because a courageous regent and her intrepid personal physician ruthlessly attack the root of the evil and take In 1755, the immediate run-up to the Seven Years' War, Maria Theresa then has Magia Postuma banned and commissions van Swieten with an expert opinion on vampirism. Both are firmly convinced that there was no such thing as vampirism. So Maria Theresa was probably not that superstitious. The Magie Postuma is loosely translated the spell of the dead. That is what makes a vampire. He is afflicted with the Magie Postuma. He does not decompose, is blood-sucking, does no good to people, strangles them, and ultimately he kills them. Superstition is the key term with Van Swieten. It appears in his treatise on vampirism and superstition in a double sense. On the one hand, it is about opposing a religious delusion, that is, the acceptance of supernatural things that are not sanctioned by the Catholic Church. And it is also about superstition in today's sense, namely an erroneous assumption about the functioning of the world, about natural connections and regularities. On the one hand, one has to bear in mind that Van Swieten could not directly oppose the belief in miracles of the Catholic Church. That means he did not speak out against supernatural phenomena per se in his writing. Rather, what he was concerned with was to separate the hearsay, the unproven claims of supernatural phenomena from the actually provable facts. He then tried to find natural explanations for these provable, comprehensible facts and thus to push back the area of the supernatural, so to speak. If you think about the life of a peasant somewhere in the world, for example in southeastern Europe, life was not characterized by a beginning, a course and an end, but it was a cycle, like the harvest, for example. The seed is sown, the grain is brought up, it's harvested, and then it's sown again. The field isn't dead, it's sown again. That may have caused people to get the idea that the earth could also produce people again. The belief in revenance is much older than Christianity. Christianity goes two ways. The official church always says that the debt cannot return. You have that with Augustine and the Catholic. The Protestants are even more radical. They say that it's not possible at all. They're all just diabolical illusions. It can't be done. But there are other churches, like the Orthodox, who are a bit more tolerant. They understand that if they say to people, in an emergency you will come back, and that's neither good for you nor for the others, because you will not go where you actually belong, namely to heaven, that's a good disciplinary tool for the living. And that's why there are vampires who are practically embedded Christianly somehow. A large part of the population was overwhelmed with these theological discourses of the time, with this abstract philosophical resurrection, and just visualized it. The vampire is a black box into which every epoch projects its wishes and desires, its secret longings, the dirty and the clean things. Humanly speaking, this may have been understandable at the time. Politically, however, it represents a time bomb that urgently needs to be diffused. Maria Theresa fights for the right faith and for order in her empire. Then there was the incident at the border. Thirty bodies were dug up by the local population in cooperation with the local authorities, but of course without the consent of the central authorities from Vienna. 
digging up 30 people. 19 are declared to be vampires because of the condition in which the corpses are found. The funerals that took place less than 18 months ago were unrolled. The execution in charge carried out these executions. They were transported to the forest on sledges with a lot of effort. An unbelievable amount of wood is used. They are cut into pieces, staked and burned. And that is, so to speak, the scandal to which van Zwieten is reacting. Gerhard van Zwieten came to Vienna in 1745 as Maria Theresa's personal physician, but also as prefect of the Imperial Court Library, which he was to remain until 1772. And he did a lot. He was a child of the Enlightenment. He was one of the first prefects to send agents all over Europe to collect scientific literature in Europe and have it brought to the Imperial Court Library. And he was also relatively well informed because he was also chairman of the Book Censorship Commission. That means that he himself read, commented on and censored many of the newly published books. Van Zwieten's position as Maria Theresa's first personal physician was a very special one. He had his own title for it, which was Proto-Medicus. Not many people in history have held this title. He was the first. And he was something like a sanitary monarch. He was in fact an absolute ruler, if you like, in his own area of responsibility, namely health care. His relationship with Maria Theresa was certainly a particularly close one, even beyond his function as imperial personal physician. One must bear in mind that princes in modern times, early modern times and the Middle Ages, were quasi-sacred as bodies and quite isolated. So to get to see a ruler at all was actually something quite extraordinary for the people. That's why these processions or parades were so important. When the emperor, Franz Josef, showed himself in public, the body of the ruler or ruleress was quite isolated from the public, and the personal physician, naturally, had to be an exception for functional reasons. It was her will that Van Swieten should be the only decisive authority in this area at the Viennese court. And he exercised the responsibility over the entire medical staff at court. There were many court physicians, personal physicians. There also was a hunting surgeon, a court apothecary, nurses, midwives. All this personnel was directly subordinate to Van Swieten, and in the extension of this absolute claim to power of the monarchy, Van Swieten was also in a very important position to decisively determine the health service in the entire monarchy. On the one hand, he did a great deal for the holdings of the Imperial Court Library, but on the other hand, he also made a great deal of structural changes. During his time, there was a major structural problem. The State Hall, built between 1723 and 1726, was at that time the room where everything was housed. Manuscripts, prints, globes, papyri, musicalia. So this room was the main room of the library, and Gerhard van Swieten said that it's necessary to do something as the State Hall had become unbalanced. Van Swieten had been summoned to Vienna in 1744 when Maria Theresa's sister, Anne of Lorraine, was dying of childbed fever. Although he had been unable to help her, van Swieten had made a great impression on Maria Theresa. As an enlightened humanist, he was now to also give the Empress the reputation of a modern monarch in Europe. Thank you.
The Enlightenment is a pan-European phenomenon that works through the networking of scholars, through the clergy, in contrast to a large part of the population, which remained stuck in a pre-modern pattern of interpretation. I think it's more of a social differentiation that's necessary than a spatial one. One knew a great deal about the fate of the dead on the battlefield. The dead then lay there, and one could observe how nature reabsorbed these corpses, putrefaction and decomposition on the battlefield. But there was no research at that time on what happens when a corpse is buried, because exhuming the dead was not common, and therefore a lot was unknown about the fate of the dead under the earth. Van Swieten even mentions the example of a period of 15 years after which the graves can be reburied. If one very carefully opens a coffin after 15 years, and he refers to his own experiment, then, according to Van Swieten, one would find these corpses still completely intact on the outside, and only at the slightest vibration or touch would they crumble to dust and prove that they have long since decomposed. But the essential thing is that Van Swieten basically uses the factors that would also be used today. The decomposition process under the earth is much slower than above it. A rule of thumb is a factor of about eight. It depends on the composition of the soil, so anything can happen, especially after relatively short periods of time. Van Swieten's introduction to the Theatrum Anatomicum in Vienna and the essential steps he took to modernize dissection and post-mortem examinations also contributed significantly to the Enlightenment. In principle, autopsies were performed in Central Europe from about the 15th century onwards. Leonardo da Vinci also performed autopsies. We know these great pictures of the bodies by the artist. People did autopsies, partly in opposition to the church, but it was not common. And it was precisely this vampire disease that made Maria Theresa realize that autopsies are very important as a preventive measure for detecting epidemics. And Joseph II then took this further. From Maria Theresa onwards, the Habsburg Empire was a pioneer in autopsies in Europe. Since witches no longer existed, or were no longer allowed to exist in the 18th century, it was the vampires. And you had a scapegoat. You had an evil being that causes other people in a village to die. Then you destroy it and stake it and burn it. And afterwards, you have your peace. The vampire is the classic scapegoat. And one would have to say, cynically, in contrast to witches, this is actually a harmless story. It's simply corpses that are destroyed and not living people. But the function is the same. Come. As a characteristic feature of a vampire, it was found during the exhumations of the dead that the skin of the vampires peeled off with the nails and a new, quite shiny, smooth skin emerged underneath. 
und darunter eine neue, ganz glänzende, glatte Haut entstanden. The corpses smacked, and in the male vampires there was putrefactive distension of the genitals. This was called wild signs of erection. So therefore, there is no vampire story where there is not a sexual component. Keine Vampirgeschichte, wo nicht auch eine sexuelle Komponente mitspielt, und and the skin has been described as rosy and colourful. These are all phenomena that we normally see in rotting corpses. But since there wasn't a lot of knowledge about rot and decay, even among doctors at the time, these changes, typical of vampires but in reality quite normal, could be sold as vampire signs. Van Sweeten himself called this superstition the barbarism of ignorance and decided to eradicate these conditions by all means. The natives called it Vervampirung and was known to the population in this region. People knew a lot about it and knew that it was very dangerous. When this epidemic broke out, the rural population, which was essential for the supply of the military garrisons, demanded that these vampires be killed. And they also knew how best to do it. The surest means to get rid of them are always the pre-Christian ones. Stake through the chest, head off, and then burn everything. And that's still the best way to get rid of a vampire. They demand the vampire execution. They insist, so to speak, that their government protects them from this supernatural threat. So it's not that easy for the central power to intervene and save its authority. It is a kind of rebellion against the order that he is trying to impose at this time. And that's another aspect that comes into play. Van Swieten is trying to reform medical education, the training in anatomy. Van Swieten versucht the medizinische Ausbildung to reform. When this epidemic was discovered in Serbia, for which there was no explanation and which had never been seen before, the disease which the locals called Vervampirung was popularized in Europe as a Serbian disease. It all started with an article on 21st of July 1725 in the Viennese Diarium, and it was about an exhumation in a small village. According to witnesses, a certain Peter Plagojavich was said to have haunted his relatives after his death. The Viennese Diarium was the publication organ of the imperial court and was widespread so that certainly not only Gerhard van Swieten, but many others probably first learned of these so-called vampires. For the first time, Vampiri is written in this article in the newspaper. After this has died down, it becomes virulent again, because there are very spectacular incidents in Medvedia and Serbia. Then the debate really begins. In France, too, the famous Parisian magazine Mercure de France and the London Gentleman's magazine write about the vampires from Medvedia, and there are the wildest speculations about them. It must be said, however, that in all these reports, the belief in vampires is described as a superstitious spook, 
For because of these incidents in Habsburg-occupied Serbia, a local term, a local word, vampire, becomes a European household name. The subject of vampirism found its way into the learned world, but also into publications that were accessible to a larger general public, such as magazines and newspapers, and Gerhard van Swieten was certainly aware of that too. Strictly speaking, vampires have only existed since 1732, because there was no word for them before that. And also the word vampire does not exist in any Balkan language at that time, but is probably a misunderstanding. And with the vampire, cultural misunderstandings play a big role. And I always imagine that the interpreter mumbled this word, and the doctors who then wrote it down, the Austrian military doctors, did not understand the word correctly. And that's how the vampire came into being. In 1755, there was this prohibition of magician posthumously. That is, the prohibition to exhume the dead, to mutilate the dead, to stake the dead, or to burn the dead. All these things that were done to undercut Revitanism. And that goes back to a very specific case in Moravia. When I said earlier that these cases mainly occur in Serbia and Bosnia, that's very selectively true. Because in Moravia, which was actually relatively in the center of this Habsburg monarchy, there were obviously also such cases. And it's precisely the case that Frederick II then takes up has it massively processed in the media, that this belief still exists in the Habsburg monarchy. The problem that Van Swieten faces, and that of Empress Maria Theresa, is a political one, a regulatory one, a diplomatic one, if you like. It has to do with the fact that the Prussian king presumably placed a news item in the Berlin press in which the empress herself is accused, so to speak, of having ordered the exhumation of 30 corpses at this border site. An incredible affront. And Frederick II does something quite infamous. He has this published by two newspapers. And we all know that if something is in two newspapers, then it's true. So this tactic of working with media redundancy is something Frederick II masters very well. And he works very well with the image of the regressiveness of the political opponent. And the belief in vampires is very much a means, an argument for Frederick II and his propaganda work. The intention is clear. Frederick II wants to distinguish his modern Silesia from the backward Silesia, still under Habsburg rule, which is entrenched in superstition. An interesting aspect which one might add is that the vampire is a phenomenon of the periphery of the border. From Vienna's point of view, it is the ignorant Serbian peasants. The explanation that Van Swieten also gives for this is that it is essentially an influence of the Greek Orthodox Church. So this comes from the outside, so to speak. It's an influence that is brought in from outside and threatens the cohesion of Catholic doctrine. And Prussia, in turn, sees it as a Catholic problem. That this superstition, vampirism, is combined here with the Catholic cult of the saints and so on, so that overall it is seen as proof of the backwardness of Catholicism. And that raised the tension between Prussia and Austria. Van Swieten makes it his resolution to combat the reputation-damaging threat that was sweeping into Vienna from afar. But in order to expose vampirism as humbug, it was first necessary to know what exactly a vampire was and how to recognize one. The Enlightener, in the service of Her Majesty, meticulously put his research on paper. He wanted to know whether it was natural phenomenon or imagination. 
In paragraph 3 of his treatise, Van Swieten dealt specifically with the manifestations of vampires, with the question of whether they actually rise from their graves and haunt the living. And he tried to get credible descriptions of what this appearance looks like. And the problem, for him of course it was no problem, because he could immediately relegate it to the realm of legend, there were no descriptions at that time. People described things differently, namely that they experienced feelings of fear and anxiety in their sleep, even mortal fear, and they saw black cats, dogs, even a black sow, so to speak, and interpreted this as an incarnation of the devil or as a vampire apparition. The hallucinations of the people could be explained by the very high fever. The people were afraid of also falling ill with this disease, and when they thought about their present condition in the fever, then they had anxiety, feelings of fear, and fantasized about the previously deceased. These are the autopsy protocols from Medvedev, 1731. And when I read these protocols, a picture of these autopsies arises in my mind. What did these doctors perceive? And if you correlate these findings with possible diseases, then you realize that this must have been an anthrax epidemic. If you study the histories of these deceased, how quickly they died. What did they eat before? How did they behave before? That confirms that this epidemic in 1731 was an anthrax endemic, that is, a circumscribed series of illnesses in this locality. Anthrax is a disease that can affect the intestines, lung or skin. The increased bacterial growth significantly alters the rotting process underground. Well, usually a dead person does not make any noise. But when there's putrefactive gas development, the lungs are compressed and then it can happen that liquid escapes from the mouth and nose mixed with bubbles. And if you listen, you can hear a bubbling in the mouth and nose, and it sounds like smacking. And if you approach a coffin, so to speak, or a corpse that shows such changes, then you could mistakenly believe that this corpse is smacking. When you get lung anthrax, the regional lymph glands in the area of the collarbones swell up, hump forward a bit, and shimmer through the skin in blue-black. That looks like a hickey, a suction mark on the neck. And from this arose the rumour, with the simultaneous shortness of breath of the people and the dwindling of the life force, that the vampires had sucked the life force out of the throat of the living. But the outrageous thing is that he's dead, but still walks around. The village says he mustn't do that, and makes every possible effort to get rid of him again. This is the revenant we know from Germanic tradition, for example. And I suspect that the vampire is nothing other than the revenant in a Balkan guise. In my opinion, the drinking of blood is also likely to be a misunderstanding of these military doctors. The villagers didn't tell anything about drinking blood. 
erzählen nichts vom Blut trinken, die erzählen nur, dass ein Wesen in der Nacht. They only said that a creature comes to them in the night that oppresses and crushes them and causes other people to die. But the drinking of blood was probably only added in the interpretation, because blood comes out of the orifices of the vampire. The presumed vampire corpse. That looked as if they drank blood. In the open air, a body rots and decomposes much more quickly than in the ground where there is a lack of oxygen. A corpse that has been lying in the air for a week can already show changes that can only be seen in a corpse under the ground after two or three months. The relationship between Catholicism and Orthodoxy in southeastern Europe, where people mainly believed in vampires, or where people mainly knew about them, was on the one hand a tense one. People had different ideas about life after death in many respects, so they both believed in resurrection. That's very important. What I think is the big difference is the relationship to the incorruptible body. How do you deal with it when a dead body does not decompose for some reason. In both Catholicism and Orthodoxy, there's something like a belief in the saints, which assumes a holy incorruptibility. Nevertheless, I think we can say that in general, the image of incorruption is better in Catholicism than in Orthodoxy. In Orthodoxy, people believe that incorruption is actually a sign of damnation. In the context of his vampire writing, it's quite clear. He relied on the reports of two doctors he had sent. They were an anatomy professor and a military doctor who was supposed to find out the facts, so to speak, and see what was going on. And after their return, they delivered their reports, and van Swieten incorporated their reports into his treatise and transformed them. The background of the vampire stories changes over the centuries, but all the stories are set in their own homes and are mystically charged. They range from poor peasants to princesses to irresistible counts. Everything seems possible. The vampire is intellectually dead with the vampire decree and van Swieten. Around the middle of the 18th century, nobody believed in them anymore, except maybe a few esoterics and crazy people. But the vampire was done for after the Enlightenment. Even though belief in vampires has always been described as superstition, the phenomenon has spread rapidly and has also become mixed with local traditions. The story of the so-called vampire princess, Eleonora Amelia Schwarzenberg, née Lobkowitz, has also captured people's imagination. The princess was unable to fulfill her husband's longed-for wish for a child, so any means seemed to be justified in order to finally become pregnant. Even the regular drinking of wolf's milk and all kinds of nocturnal rituals were supposed to help. The novella Camilla was a scandal at the time it was written. It was about the love affair between a female vampire and another woman. The vampire is strongly associated with sexuality and physical love and physical union, and thus this tale, Carmilla, which tells of a female friendship and also of the desire for a female union, is definitely a transgression of bourgeois values. The story had an influence on many vampire tales and horror stories that were written afterwards, 
It had a very great influence on Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, because in one of the first drafts, he originally also wanted to set his story in Styria. In his manuscripts, there's a note that the action is set in Styria. This was later crossed out and Transylvania was written over it. Bram Stoker was not a very original author. It has to be said that even Dracula, a novel that has come to high literary canonical honors today, is actually well-written trash. The vampire is actually a sexless, androgynous figure. But since in our culture the qualities that characterize a vampire, that is, strength, assertiveness, will, domination, aggressiveness, are primarily equated with men, one can certainly speak of vampires having a stronger male profile. The vampire is a dream machine, so to speak, a black box. And people give this figure a face, a character, as they wish. And sometimes things are mixed up. So religious elements came together with Hollywood, and somehow a new vampire was created. And that's why the vampire, which exists outside the orthodox area, has probably also been brought in, has been imported, especially through later cultural products. One should not always expect rationality in these things. The vampire has no blood circulation, no beating heart, so all ideas of sex are completely pointless. He can't get an erection, for example. So every doctor says there are certain things for which you need a breath and a blood circulation. Of course, he doesn't have all that. When myth meets reality, insurmountable contradictions can arise. Very few people have asked themselves a very interesting, logical question. After all, the vampire must have supernatural powers to get out of a grave. You can do the self-test, although I don't recommend it. If you have two cubic meters of earth on you, that's more than two tons. Even Schwarzenegger couldn't get out. This has always been explained with the supernatural powers of the vampire, of course, but it's a damn arduous task. The imaginary world of vampires also includes bats. Interesting, because they don't actually suck blood. There are bats that lick blood, of course not ours, but mainly in South and Central America. They don't suck, they lick, they have a set of teeth that is ideal for that. With these very sharp little teeth, they lightly scratch the skin and then lick, so to speak, these few drops of blood that ooze out of everywhere. So they don't suck it up, they lick it up. Only an external similarity between vampires and bats can be named by zoology. In the meantime, it has been found out that some flying foxes are certainly more like Count Dracula. They quasi tighten their cloak or wings around their body, and that's what these other bats do as well. The vampire the vampire very often serves as a kind of literary or cinematic cipher for a migrant woman whom one either desires or fears. That's probably why our time is so interested in vampires, because we have this migration again and again. And many of the most famous vampires were migrants. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a Romanian who plans an invasion of Britain. Bekanntesten Vampire waren Migranten. Bram Stoker's Dracula ist ein Rumäne, 
Today you would say, that's the perfect book for Brexit. I've always dreamed of doing a special Brexit edition of Dracula. Van Swieten's role goes far beyond that of a vampire hunter. His reforms range from botany to medicine to politics. He was the founder of the botanical gardens at the Hortus Medicus and a politician at the highest level. Among his greatest achievements, he prepared the ground for the rise of scientific medicine. But Van Swieten did not and could not say goodbye to the belief in supernatural phenomena at that time. He had to be careful not to touch the Catholic Church's belief in miracles, for example, not to question it. So he did not fundamentally question the possibility of the existence of supernatural phenomena at all. But what he did, and this is actually very modern, he wanted to separate rumours, unproven facts, observations that are based on hearsay, on stories, on errors, quite clearly from the provable, comprehensible facts. Paradoxically, the struggle of bureaucracy against vampirism has only provided the stage for this phenomenon to spread across Europe. As early as 1725, there was the first report in the Viennese news. In 1732, there was a large Europe-wide debate, which was taken up by this incipient developing media in Europe. And in this respect, the European public, if you like, owes the subject to the Habsburg bureaucracy. Van Swieten's final report calls things as they are. Van Swieten, the medical advisor to Empress Maria Theresa, wrote a paper on the vampire belief, and he came to the conclusion that the vampire disease only exists where superstition and ignorance prevail. Because he came to the conclusion that behind all these phenomena are phenomena that can be explained scientifically and that need to be researched but the superstition about vampires only exists where people are ignorant. Gerhard van Swieten wrote this on behalf of Maria Theresa. At that time, she had lost patience. Gerhard van Swieten sent two doctors he trusted. These two doctors then brought a report back to Vienna, which was entirely in Van Swieten's spirit, namely that this was superstition, stupidity, that it could all be explained, that it had natural causes and so on. Nevertheless, he did not want this to reach the general public, which also shows that this treatise, which he wrote in French, the language of the court, was not intended for a wider public. It was not accessible to a wider public. This treatise was handwritten and was primarily intended for the imperial house, for Maria Theresa, and for his closest scholarly circle. Van Swieten, as the model on which Bram Stoker based his literary vampire hunter, Van Helsing. The more I think about it, the more appealing the thesis seems to me. Not only because of the Dutch name, but there are certain similarities. It is very daring and highly speculative, but not to be completely dismissed. Van Swieten is quite a charming idea and therefore I liked it very much. Gerhard van Swieten was the model for Bram Stoker's vampire hunter, Abraham van Helsing, presumably because he was so successful with his hunt for these supposed undead who bring so much misfortune to people who are responsible for the deaths of so many people. He dispelled that superstition. 
Van Swieten's position as an authority in his own right at the Viennese court, like a second regent, with great decision-making power, remained unique throughout his life. He was seemingly independent, and yet always in close contact with Empress Maria Theresa. Maria Theresa, Maria Theresa remained closely associated with her personal physician until his death. It turns out that this was much more than just a doctor-patient relationship or the relationship of a ruler to a close associate. When van Swieten died in June 1772 at his Viennese summer residence, the Imperial Palace at Schönbrunn, Maria Theresa was present in person at his hour of death.